Please be seated. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we read these words. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Therefore, relying on the love and grace which was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, we courageously review our lives as well as the human condition together. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Before your light, O God, we become aware of the shadows in which we live. In the midst of your abundant gifts, we sense the poverty of our spirits. Daring to identify the plight of sisters and brothers who hunger and mourn, who suffer disease and oppression, we realize how little we are willing to do or give up or change in our lives to ease their pain. Forgive us, loving God, for focusing on our narrow concerns and complaints with our intense self-interest. By your Spirit, help us to recognize the ways we may share your healing power and love. Open us to sacrifices of thanksgiving and a pure joy. We also read these words in 2 Timothy chapter 1. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. We have died to sin in him, so let us as people freed by grace, by faith, rejoice. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. Please be seated. And good morning and welcome to a special service of worship in the life of the congregation. Today is World Communion Sunday. And if you didn't know, we Presbyterians actually started World Communion Sunday back in 1933. The first service was held at the Shadyside Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. After World War II, it was picked up by what was then called the Federal Council of Churches, now the National Council of Churches, and then eventually by the World Council of Churches. And so today, literally tens of millions of people are celebrating communion together, and we rejoice in that. If you're visiting with us today, we're so glad that you're here, and we hope this hour of worship will, of course, be uplifting and enriching for you. We welcome to those who are watching via live stream. I have just a few quick announcements to share with you. First, I want to welcome our guest preacher today who is well known to most of you, Dick Spracklow, who's been a friend of the congregation for many years. And we're all looking forward to her sharing the word with us today. Note that next Sunday, right after church, there will be a, a new member inquirers class in the library. If you've been thinking about uh, joining the church or simply want to know more about 
the House of Hope as a congregation. Please join us at 1115 in the library, and we'll look forward to seeing you there. This morning, we have an interesting adult enrichment class going on at 1115 in the assembly room. Master Gardener Mary Meyer will be here. And uh, note uh, the book that she's written. It's 10 Plants That Changed Minnesota. And I'm told that one of our own church members, Susan Davis Price, co-authored that book with her. So any questions you might have about gardening in the state of Minnesota, that's today at 1115. The choir school is kicking off their annual holiday wreath and plant sale. Uh, that'll run the next few weeks, so take note of that. And this morning we're also receiving the Peace and Global Witness offering. There's an insert in your bulletin this morning that gives you information about that, and there are envelopes in the pews to share your offering as well. Let us continue to worship God. Please join me as we read Psalm 14 responsively. The reading begins on page 581 of the Old Testament section of the Red Pew Bible. I will begin and you will read every other verse. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt. They do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. There they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will rejoice. Israel will be glad. The word of the Lord.
Today's New Testament lesson comes from Luke 14. One of the dinner guests, on hearing this, said to him, Blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, Someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I have bought a piece of land, and I must go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I am going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I have just been married, and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, Go out at once into the streets and the lanes of town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. And the slave said, Sir, what you ordered has been done, and there is still room. Then the master said to the slave, Go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. The word of the Lord. Pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Some of my most poignant memories of community were created around food. As a child, I relished the Thanksgiving dinners that we had with grandparents and aunts and uncles and lots of cousins in a small town in Iowa. We gathered there to celebrate with turkey, mashed potatoes and gravy, oh yes, and jello with marshmallows and pumpkin and apple pie. As a pastor, I have been moved by laughter and tears at funeral receptions over meals of potato salad and ham sandwiches deviled eggs and cookies and cakes and pies. And at weddings, we bring in far-flung friends and relatives who come to celebrate the joyful occasion with the bride and groom, eating together and being served often scrumptious wedding cake. We give hospitality as we welcome and invite in acquaintances who, through dining together, become friends and companions. The word companion comes from the Latin cum, meaning with, and panis, meaning bread. Our companions are those with whom we break bread. One of the earliest restaurants in Europe had a Latin inscription over the door. It went like this, venite ad me omnis qui stomaco and I'm going to help us really... Did you get that? <laughs> I didn't either. <laughs> but it translates into English, Come to me, all those whose stomachs cry out in anguish, and I shall restore you. That is a takeoff of what Jesus said, of course, in Matthew 11. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavily burdened, and I will give you rest. It is actually very appropriate to link Jesus with food, because really, every time you turn around in the scriptures, Jesus is eating and drinking. He began his ministry turning water into wine at a wedding. 
and then he fed the 5,000 at the hillside. He was known for eating and drinking with sinners, and he said that others called him a glutton and a wine-bibber. Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples and later fed them breakfast on the beach. Sharing food and parables about eating in the kingdom of heaven are significant. They tell us of a God of joy and celebration, a God who sustains life and health, a God who offers us soul food, the very bread of heaven. In today's text, Jesus is at it again. Here he is, eating at the home of a leading Pharisee. It was on the Sabbath, and Jesus had just told a parable already, which advised a host to not invite people who could repay him, but to invite those in real need. Jesus said, you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. Then, if that wasn't embarrassing enough to his host, Jesus went on to tell today's parable, one which was not what we would call socially sensitive, at least to his host and their guests, perhaps, too. It is the story of the great banquet. The host is wealthy and has a servant whom he sends out to remind his guests that the feast is now ready. But what a stinging surprise. The ones who had been invited all start to bow out. Apparently, this double invitation, the second reminder, was a normal thing then. It gave the other guests a chance to hear who's going to be there. Apparently, word had spread, and as the servant checked in with each guest, they made excuses, paltry excuses. I bought some cows. I bought a field and have to look at it. I just got married. I cannot come. In the 1960s, the singing nuns became quite a sensation, and Sister Miriam Therese Winter's simple songs of gospel stories included this banquet scene in Luke 14. It's also in a Matthew ch um, chapter. The wedding banquet is a song that repeats this parable. The refrain is about those who gave their flimsy excuses. I've known it forever. You may remember it. I cannot come to the banquet. Don't bother me now. I have married a wife. I have bought me a cow. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum. Pray hold me excused. I cannot come. Naturally, the host, who was shunned by so many important people he'd invited, had abundant tables of food awaiting them. Think of the gardeners here, with tomatoes and zucchinis having been planted innocently last June or so. Now they're spilling over on shelves, in baskets, buckets on the stairs, and you're desperate to give away these tomatoes while they're good to someone who will eat them before they spoil. That host's preparations and luscious food was ready with nobody to enjoy it. So what did this host do? He sent out his servants into the streets to bring in the poor and the maimed and the blind and the lame. Anyone on, that they could find on the streets, grab them, bring them in. These guests now invited to come in were not the ones who had gained much in this world and they got to feast at the master's table. Scandalous. Of course, it is a parable. This is all about God's table in the kingdom. God is lifting up and including the very people who are humble and not self-sufficient and efficient and award-winning and successful. They are hungry people grateful for food.
Do you recall the 1967 film, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner? It starred Sidney Poitier with Katharine Hepburn and Spencer Tracy. It was in color, but it was literally about black and white. It was about a black man coming to dine at the table of a white couple, and not just as a friend, but as their future son-in-law. It broke barriers then, 55 years ago. And if we look around our social and even religious gatherings, I fear we have to admit that for the most part, we haven't yet succeeded in eliminating racial and many other barriers. Hospitality extended to anyone that is seen as other is hard. From our birth, our society has implanted ideas of inequality as a matter of course. But in an evolving multi multiracial and pluralistic society, it has been suggested that we need to further break down our barriers. One exercise suggests this. Think about your own community, maybe the whole Twin Cities or an area of it. Imagine, they say, that everyone exists in the community in an invisible box. The inside walls of the box have a mirror effect so that we perceive nothing that is not reflected in our own image. We are vaguely aware of the poor and the destitute of our community, but what we see or think of them is, more than likely, done without thought. In most in instances, when we pass each other on the street or in a store, we relate to one another separated by the boxes. As long as we remain isolated, we have no opportunity for genuine community, no opportunity to learn from each other. But in Jesus' teachings, as in today's parable, he describes a God who is continually present in the world, calling us out of our boxes and into relationships with all people, countering the forces that keep us in isolation, bringing in new people, the other people, into our experiences. And we build community as we get to know the person we had always seen as different, and we break down social barriers. When we lived in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, I volunteered at a soup kitchen called The Banquet. Its motto was, we will not serve the poor poorly. This Luke 14 parable was their inspiration to prepare a beautiful table, complete with flowers. The servers and, and hungry guests were to be seated together. After we'd dished out servings for a while, we each were to pick up a plate, join the line, and then sit down at a table and converse with the other guests. When a child had a birthday, a professionally decorated cupcake topped with a lit candle was ceremoniously delivered amidst the singing of happy birthday by everyone there. Imagine many tears welling up because so many of these children had never had their birthday celebrated with candles and with such joyful singing. And so I think of the children, often viewed as the least of these, all around us. Bread for the World, a Christian lobbying group for the hungry, notes globally, Hunger is reaching historic levels. Before the pandemic, 135 million people went hungry. Now, 270 million go hungry. It doubled. 
They go on, malnutrition is responsible for nearly half of all preventable deaths among children under five. By next year, nearly 14 million more children are likely to be severely malnourished because of the pandemic's impacts. This means that almost 59 million young children, or almost the whole population of South Africa, will likely face life-threatening malnutrition if the global community doesn't act. And here in the US, despite recognition of the importance of nutrition, one in six children are at risk of hunger. And among children younger than three, even brief episodes of hunger can cause lasting damage to a child's mental and physical development. It's painful to realize that experts say that there is enough food to feed every person on the planet. It is our policies of lack of opening up to distribution channels that holds the food back from those in such desperate need. If today's parable models who we are to claim as guests at the table, who it is we should literally feed, it is certainly the children and the widows, the resident alien, the refugees of wars, and victims of climate change, any at the bottom of the ladder. Over and over, Jesus calls his followers to acts of love and mercy and proclaims, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. When Harvard Divinity School professor frames mercy another way, he says, there are two kinds of people. There are therefore people, and there are however people. Therefore people say, there are children going to bed hungry every night in our community, and they devise to proceed they proceed to devise the ways in which they can meet that need. The however people make the same beginning statement of the children going to bed hungry, but then they go on to explain why nothing much can be done about it. Think about it. Have you been a therefore person, one who devises ways to meet the needs? How might we better become part of the solution? How can we as God's community go out into the streets and change unjust conditions? Every October, we used to shelter homeless families in Project Home. Now they are given houses by the nuns at St. Kate's at the Carondelet Center. Yet Project Home still needs funding and volunteers, of course. And we can also help food shelves by making those shopping carts by the back and front entrances overflow each week. One friend says that at least once a month, she shops for an extra meal's worth of food and goods for the food shelf. Food for the hungry. Think of our abundant vegetable garden, our serving meals for the homeless are helping assemble the food items for thousands of meals with Feed My Starving Children, right in Egan, so close by. It nourishes children all over the world. Our financial gifts and our other offerings are important too, of course. Let's each be people who selflessly bring into the streets God's abundant love and hope making a difference for good in our hurting world. Today's table fellowship is a sacramental meal, reminding us that we are God's own. The Holy Spirit is present with us as we take part, and the same Spirit sends us on our way 
to spread the news of hope, to reach out and to invite in. The host calls us, along with our brothers and sisters, companions in Christ all over the world, to the table. On the front of the bulletin is a revision of the refrain of the singing nun song, The Banquet. I'm going to sing through it, and you can join me the second time through, if you will. Yes, I will come to the banquet to celebrate. Of course, I will bring along my partner and perhaps ride my horse. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum, but I shall not miss the party. I will come. Yes, I will come to the banquet to celebrate. Of course, I will bring along my partner and perhaps ride my horse. I have fields and commitments that cost a pretty sum, but I shall not miss the party. I will come. Hallelujah. Amen. of the Belhar Confession. We believe in one holy, universal Christian Church, the unity of the communion of saints of the entire human family, and we believe that that unity of the people of God must be manifest and active in that we love one another, that we give ourselves willingly and joyfully to one another, that we all share one baptism together, that we eat of one bread and drink of one cup together, that we confess one name, one Lord, for one cause, with one hope, which is the height and the breadth and the depth and the love of Christ, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated. The Christian Church, though sometimes flawed, still strives to live this good news, 
the good news taught by Jesus of Nazareth. We ask for your pledges and your donations to learn and teach and share this good news and to share the bread of heaven, both spiritually and physically. There are four ways to give, and you will find them in the bulletin and on our website. Friends, this table is for all of us, near and far, high and low, east and west, north and south. This table is for all of us, but it's not our table. It's not a Presbyterian table. It's not an American table. It is rather God's table for all of us. And it's a table of grace. So take your place at the table. You are welcome, you are invited, you are called. Come, let us share this meal together. The Lord is with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord, our God, creator and ruler of the universe. Even when we were dust, when our story begins in dust, you were there, your word was there, your breath into the lifeless void. And upon your word, all creation sprang into life. When we were in the wilderness, terrified, timid, you were there, your word was there, with manna just enough for today, with water, even from the driest rock, with the abundant grace upon which our story always rests. And when we fell short, slaves to power and greed, you were there. Your word was there on the lips of prophets and in all the hearts of servants. In stories of revolution, revelation, and liberation, calling us even now to acts of courage, witness, 
and peace. Therefore, we praise you joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. come to you now as your children we are bold to pray our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread and after giving thanks to God, broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat. This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, after supper, he took the cup and said, This is the blood of the new covenant, my blood shed for the remission of sins. Drink this, all of you. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
Bless the Lord, O my soul. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Gracious God, we offer our thanks for the whole communion of saints witness to this feast and for the ministry of churches around the world who gather with us today. By this broken bread, may we each be restored for the work yet to come. By this shared cup, may we each be claimed for the proclamation of your kingdom. At this shared table, may we be united as children of your promise, children of your word, dying and made new again, sent boldly together into the world as servants of your peace. Amen. into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Return no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak and help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>